No city tugs at my heart quite like New Orleans does. And nothing says New Orleans like jazz. I lived there as a young reporter working for the Times-Picayune newspaper. And after work, I'd hang out at Bullet Sports Bar or Sweet Lorraine's, listening to some of the best local jazz musicians. And trust me, there were a lot of them. This year marks the 15th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And covering that tragedy, I saw firsthand the tension between beauty and pain in New Orleans. But some beauty is born from suffering. Few know that better than New Orleans jazz legend Wynton Marcellus. Wynton Marcellus is an internationally acclaimed musician, composer, and teacher. He's the son of jazz great Ellis Marcellus, who died of complications from coronavirus back in April at age 85. But Winton is a master in his own right. Back in 1984, when he was just 22 years old, he won not one, but two Grammy Awards, one for jazz and one for classical music. In 1997, he became the first jazz musician to win the Pulitzer Prize for music for his record, Blood on the Fields. Then, in 2007, he released From the Plantation to the Penitentiary, and it hit number two on the Billboard Jazz Charts. Marcellus is also the artistic director at Jazz at Lincoln Center. That's where, in 2018, he debuted his newest work, The Ever Funky Lowdown. It's a full-length opera, and like much of Marcellus's work, it's political. And it's narrated by actor Wendell Pierce, a friend of his, going all the way back to high school. We must strike first to prevent what they may be trying to do to us and to save them. Their leaders must feel our power. Believe me, trust me, we will spare no measure or expense in the pursuit of their salvation. Can you find it in your hearts to save these poor people? I'm Tremaine Lee, and this is Into America. This summer, Winton released a record version of The Ever Funky Lowdown. Just ahead of Labor Day, we sat down to talk about his writing process and how his music is influenced by his politics and his beloved hometown. Everything is for sale, even a community, like an old New Orleans auction house. Wynn, thank you so much, brother, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yes, sir. It's really my pleasure, brother Tremaine. You've given us something really to ponder here with your new record, The Ever Funky Lowdown, and it's a full-length opera, and some are also calling it a polemic. Would you mind just describing this project for us? I mean, it's heavy, it's prescient, but from your eyes, what is this project? Well, it's a satirical spoken piece with rousing, happy music, and as narrated by Mr. Wendell Pierce, and it features a, a, a main character, Mr. Gain, who was a combination of a politician, street hustler, dolomite, evangelical preacher, Honorable Barker, Con man. Our government has agreed to make a few small changes to our laws. The path is now cleared for us to liberate these people, extend our dominion, and increase our wealth. It's a win, win, win for us. And in this game, winning is the only thing. He convinces you to sell out your integrity and buy into a progression of actions that lead to beating a group of others he identifies for you. And our piece is really a blueprint to help us go deeper than propaganda and for, to help us uh, rise above the hustle and think for ourselves. It's, it's bipartisan and it's anti-sectarian. And it concludes that we have to have a deeper level of involvement in the life of our largest identifiable community. And that community is anybody who's trying to help solve a problem with you. It also addresses the meaning of freedom and the need to fight for agency for each other. So it doesn't sound totally fictional. No. I mean, you think about some of the political chicanery we've been going through, the corruption. No. It sounds like it's based no, it's on not, it's not some folks we know. <laughs> it's not fictional, but I studied also many leaders from Julius Caesar to Napoleon to Adolf Hitler to the American presidents that I've known, speeches that I've heard. A lot of this comes from kind of experience I've had being in our country and traveling to so many states and teaching in so many schools. But it's also based on historical precedent. And it could be things that I heard Reverend Ike say on TV in the 1970s or Oral Roberts. I kind of put everybody's thing together 
all the people who are really interested in hustling people and who people love to be hustled by. And uh, I think it does that, but the music also has that. It's kind of panoramic view of different styles of American music. Funk, which I grew up playing in the 1970s. Jazz, swing, and the music that I that dedicated my life to playing. It sets a difference between the, the music and, and the words. The words are kind of all Hudson's language. And the music is very, uh, from the perspective of the people who are participating in the hustling. You started performing this back in 2018. Right. And so what was the inspiration then? I mean, it's so fitting now, but what was the inspiration back then? Well, these are not topical issues. You know, these are issues that have affected human beings since the beginning of time. It could be, you take your pick. I said, you could go back in time. It could be that the in any culture you go into, there's always some group of others that people determine that they're going to pick on. And, and so obviously for those of us who are arriving at this project, like right now through a 2020 lens, when you have the uprisings across the country, you have the police violence, it's hard not to take all of those factors into account as we listen. For you, as the creator of this, are you also seeing it through a different lens given what we're going through right now? Yeah, because police violence didn't start now. It, I wrote a, I did an album in 20, 2007, it's called From the Plantation to the Penitentiary. And I have to always tell people that we were black before before 1980. Like there was a whole right. culture. And like it, there's a lot of this stuff. And it, this piece is not only about black Americans. It's, it's, it's from a black American perspective, which is my perspective, but it deals with uh, deals with many, many issues and subjects of a human nature. And it shows how we are rolled into the larger context of humanity. And how you notice when people started to protest for George Floyd, it resonated with people all over the world who have their own struggles. And I also don't, I don't work on things like their projects. You know, it's their way of life to me. My daddy was a musician. I grew up in music. I've been working on my compositional skills and all this since I was a teenager. Everything is connected. So the same things I was trying to articulate on Blood on the Fields in the, in the 1990s, I'm still trying to articulate them in the 2000s and uh, so on and so forth. Here's the lowdown. She was unwavering in the execution of her duty, refused to be silenced, followed the word and held to it. Her name was Fannie Lou Hamer. Many songs struck me and stuck with me, and one of those is uh, the ballad of Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou. Yeah. Especially given the time we're in now, where the vote is so important. It's so important that some people are trying to keep us, black folks especially, and poor folks especially, from accessing the vote. You think about Fannie Lou Hammer saying she's sick and tired of being sick and tired, and how important she was to the movement. Why did you choose her as an inspiration? Well, my mom loved her. You got to remember, I was I was alive in the 60s, so I remember Fannie Lou. I remember them talking about her being on TV. The community work she did with Freedom Forum, how she was helping rural people with health and well-being, even with small business opportunities. And this was a woman that was the eldest of 20 kids and grew up on, on a plantation, segregated in Mississippi. She worked with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with voter registration in her region. She was shot at. She was beaten. She was all kind of stuff happened to her, but you could not turn her around. Hmm. She ran for Congress. She wasn't successful, but hey, she's running from, from Congress in Mississippi. So she always represented a kind of uh, ultimate heroism. I mean, I always loved Fannie Lou, and uh, she's a great heroine and perfect for this time. And, and I use her also because people don't know who she is now, and she sacrificed a lot. And part of the hallmarks of being lost is you don't know your elders. You don't know what people have sacrificed. So you think every time you confront a problem, it's a new problem. And you can't use 
the victories of your past to help you develop a more constructive strategy for defeating the problems of the present. And you said that you don't consider these works projects. It's all linked, right? It's a, it's a lifestyle. Right. And you go back to Blood on the Fields and Black Codes and from the plantation to the penitentiary. And now this work, is there ever any pressure to not get political, right? Because you can do very well just jazz at Lincoln Center, stick to the, to the, the traditions. But is there pressure to either go this route or go the opposite route? No, not, not to me. You know, I grew up dealing with a lot of, uh, of, of prejudice, but I, I don't... I, I don't tell that many stories about it. It's okay. It's, it's, a lot of people struggle a lot more. Look at family rules life. I, I had the kind of life you would have if you grew up in the segregated South. And uh, I've always been interested in that. I was interested in Frederick Douglass in the 1960s. I wrote a term paper in, in high school on slavery. Um, it, it's something I've, I'm, I'm interested in. So I tend to, to talk about it and deal with it. It's not a struggle for me. I don't feel any pressure. Uh, and of course, I've been against many things that I felt denigrated black people. If black people love themselves, and I don't have a problem standing against them uh, to say to say what I believe. And uh, people sometimes over my career have written me hate mail and stuff because I didn't like stuff. But I mean, I don't. I never got shot at or, or beaten for it. Besides, in the '60s, when you know assholes was being handed out, it's just because <laughs> you know you in the wrong place at the wrong time, trying to do the wrong thing. Okay, it could everybody happen. gets some. You want to ask whooping? You want to ask whooping? <laughs> but I don't feel any pressure about expressing my my opinion and point of view on this. Do you have a, a favorite song on this record? Not really, man. You know, to me, the whole record is like one song. All these kind of long pieces I've written, I don't know, maybe twenty of them. They take a lot of time to figure out the structure and the form and to work out who's going to play what and it's orchestrated. And so I look at it, it's, it's all one thing in my mind. But do you have a certain sound that you really like that came out of this? Is there something that you could break down for us? Well, I wrote a counterpoint, a contrapuntal style of the, the language of a guy named James Black, who's a great drummer in New Orleans. He wrote songs like the Magnolia Triangle. I went po do de po we le bo de do do to de o to do de po we le de do do to de do do de do 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 de do do to de do like New Orleans kind of got that kind of New Orleans lean, but it's in five four. So I use a kind of language like he, him, and my father, the musicians, were trying to play modern jazz in the sixties with Jews, and I write other lines, contrapuntal lines, on the bottom and the top and I put it in different grooves in different times. So in that context, yeah, that's, I like that, that type of contrapuntal writing. I had done some of it on Blood on the Field, but I expanded on that type of sound in this piece. After the break, we talk about the influence of Wynn's father, jazz legend Ellis Marcellus, who passed away earlier this year. And Wynn reflects on the role of music in processing grief. We're back with Wynton Marcellus. Oh, this life don't bother me. Soon I will be free. You know, of all the things we've lost over the last several months from COVID-19 and the uprisings, I think one of the sadder for many of us has been uh, the loss of your father, you know, knowing New Orleans and knowing New Orleans couldn't send you, your father home the way the city would have liked to. And I'm sure you all as a family would have liked to. And the Ever Funky Lowdown is dedicated to your father, who is, for those who may not know, is Ellis Marcellus, a musical giant, a great, a mountain of a man. Could you explain to us and those who just don't know um, who Ellis Marcellus, your father, was and the role and influence um, that he played growing up? My father is someone who would play in a in a bar, in a club for two or three people for years just to keep the music going. He would teach kids for no money. He would teach everywhere, go deep in the hood and teach everybody. People come to our house, he'd treat everybody like they were his kids. 
he was very philosophical. He, you know, he believed. He had a belief system, and he was not a a person who followed the crowd. And he was very quiet in the circle, and he talked a lot. But he was very non-judgmental of people. But he had he believed in scholarship and being serious. He took his life seriously. I saw him. I went, I went on gigs with him from the time I was born. So wow. I saw his his struggle, and uh, it stays with me. So what was the biggest lesson? I mean, obviously there are many, but for you, the biggest lesson that you carry with you to this day from your father? That you can, you can stand and sit in your belief, but you just have to take what comes with it. A lot of what comes with it you may not like, but if you can't handle it, change your belief system. But you don't have to go with the crowd. And you also don't have to be hostile to people because he wasn't hostile. He was not bitter. He wasn't that type of man. He was very accepting of things and of people. He did not, he didn't compromise his beliefs, especially when it came to the music. What's amazing is that men such as your father and then you and your brothers and your family and so many great musicians coming out of New Orleans, you know, a place full of diametrically opposing forces, right? It's as beautiful as it is ugly, right? It's as <laughs> peaceful as it is dangerous. Um, and I lived down there for a while, so I, you know, I, I understand it. Um, <laughs> Right. I wonder how that shaped all that shaped you that like that that space in between that pressure. And you know, I was all around the city, played parades, all aspects of the city. I lived in it, played, and we played in funk bands. So we played big dances at the top of Gaylord with three bands playing. We played police talent shows and all the poorest areas of the city. We played in clubs like Caesar's East. We I played also with the with the New Orleans Philharmonic. I played with the Civic Orchestra. I played. Uh, Stuff like the Bob Hope show would come. I played the circus in New Orleans. I played everywhere. And, you know, I've been at gigs where people was getting shot. I've been at gigs where we broke out in the fights. I've been at gigs where people sat politely with their tuxedos and listened to music. I've been on gigs where we were dancing. Most of my gigs was just dances, you know, with people singing pop music to old ladies in the 70s. And, uh, you know, I, play, I have a lot of experiences. And, um, uh, I've always feel grateful to grow up in the Crescent City. You know how wild we are, too. Yeah, get down. I didn't understand that other places wasn't that wild until I left <laughs> New Orleans. But, I, you know, I was fortunate with my mama let us, she let us go. When we were in high school, we didn't have to, as long as I could get my work, I could come home at 1, 2 in the morning. And me hmm. and my brother Grandpa, we did. We played, we played gigs. We were out there. Obviously, you were raised up in the music, and you're a jazz traditionalist, right? And you, you're, you're such a part of um, the American music scene and jazz music scene. But I wonder what role music and jazz in particular has played in processing grief and making sense of these very complicated things and complicated times we're living in. Well, in New Orleans, we bury people above ground. When I was six years old, I lived with my great uncle. Now, he was born in 1883. He was a stone cutter for the cemetery. So I was always in cemeteries. Uh, with him, he cut the names into stone and stuff. You know, there's always stories of the voodoo queen, and we do parades out when people die. We know death is a, is, a, is a part of life. We have a cyclical understanding of death. We deal with it with our grief very, very upfront. Of course, there's the aspect of death and grief that is so internal to each person, depending on their spiritual relationship to who has passed away. It's beyond anything a person can say about it. It's just those deep, deep, deep sentiments that yeah. they can only be be felt and intuited. And each of us is very, very different in the way we process that, when we process it, and uh, what comes of it. Hmm. In music, it's in a sound. I played so many funerals and played New Orleans dirges, so many people. Uh, walking around churches, walking around outside playing. And I know that there's some notes I can hit where I notice people start crying. Where if I put that certain type of moan that come from deep down in the note, it hit people. There's no name for it. It's just a kind of sympathetic vibration. When you think about the that spiritual nature of the music and the connection that people have to it, how important is it to maintain the traditions of what jazz music is and what it represents? Well, you know, Human beings are very cyclical and traditional. And if you want to know the condition of people, look at their mythology. What is heroic in their culture? What is virtuous? 
for their rituals of courtship, how do they deal with birth and death, and uh, what have they figured out about living in the world? What is their food like? What are their uh, ceremonies, and how do they worship? And what do they invest in? It starts to give you a sense of who the people are. So much has been made about the Confederacy in the South. And in New Orleans, I've driven around Lee Circle many, many, many times and seen Robert E. Lee atop that circle looking down on us all, right? And I know you said before that you thought that, you know, certain aspects of hip hop and the culture were more dangerous to black folks than those symbols. And now that those things are coming down and being dragged down from the folks and the people in the the communities, and in this moment now we're reckoning with race and reckoning with history and reckoning with who we say we are, do you view that aspect of things a little differently? Or do you still kind of maintain that, you know what, that other stuff is more dangerous? What I'm saying is based on years of experience with our young people, I remember when they came in. And I will never change my perspective on that. That's what I learned from my dad, watching my daddy play those gigs for no people. You don't have to go along, along with the mob. Now, if you mean they're bad at you or they don't listen to your records or they, they say stuff about you, okay, great. You know, we don't we don't need to entertain people with that kind of material. At first, it was, it was I was actually glad to see hip hop come in because I thought everything was going to be Michael Jackson, Prince kind of people trying to change their appearance and put on a thing that was was uh, not like the black music we had grown up playing and try to just see how to get into the mainstream and and come up with whatever would be acceptable to white audiences. So that's what I was thinking then. So I thought, wow, well, okay, hip hop—they reasserting the kind of Parliament, James Brown, that strain. Then when they when they met up with the pimp movies, nah, man, I can't. I'm not, not going to defend that. So I mean, it's not like my voice stopped us from doing it, but I expressed my, my opinion about it. It's like what people do with Trump. Trump is a manifestation of the problem. He's not the problem. If you waste all your time with him, don't don't look at him the whole time. Let's look at what this problem is, because there are many him. <laughs> You know, in the ever funky lowdown, uh, Mr. Game represents a lot of that, right? So you still found your way to address the concerns of today and, and connecting them to the past. Mm-hmm. And I do wonder just how tough it's been coming out with a project in this moment where movement is restricted. You know, the economy is funny. What's it actually like just moving the music around in, in this time? Well, in the evening, Jazz Linger Center, we've, we've done 300 and something things online. Mm-hmm. And we are dedicated to getting music out and to keeping our people enriched and entertained. And we're going to do more stuff in the fall. So, you know, music is our business. We've been dedicated to it for years. And we're getting stuff out. Wynton Marsalis, thank you so very, very much, man. The honor is most certainly ours. You are a, a true master of the music and a beloved son of New Orleans. And we thank you so much for, for joining us. Man, thank you so much. You know, it's been a, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Brother Tremaine. Much love, man. Wynton Marsalis is an internationally acclaimed jazz musician and composer and artistic director of Jazz at Lincoln Center. His new album is called The Ever Funky Lowdown. Into America is produced by Isabel Angel, Allison Bailey, Aaron Dalton, Max Jacobs, Barbara Rabb, Claire Tai, Aisha Turner, and Preeti Varathan. Original music by Hannes Brown. Our executive producer is Ellen Frankman. Steve Lichtai is executive producer of audio. I'm Tremaine Lee, and we'll be back on Wednesday.